So now we're talking about bio 169. Remember the third exam is be on the gastrointestinal system, also called the digestive system and also the reproductive system. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the digestive system, GI system. Remember that's going to be all be covered in the chapter 15 in that. So make sure you carefully go through the textbook and go to the end of chapter questions. And then I'll be sending you some, probably an old exam and a review sheet. Remember, you think when you think with the digestive system, you're going to start out with the esophagus. So here's my esophagus. Remember, the esophagus is going to be the proximal one third is going to be skeletal muscle. And the distal two thirds is going to be smooth. So that's going to allow me to swallow. That esophagus is going to pass through that dome-shaped muscle we've all talked about called the diaphragm. So that opening that's created inside of that diaphragm is what's called the hiatus. Hence the term hiatal hernia. So that hiatus is the opening of the diaphragm where the esophagus is going to pass and as it passes through there, there's going to be a going opening into the stomach. So here's my stomach coming down. And of course, there's a sphincter there that's going to be a involuntary smooth sphincter pressure wave. And that's going to be called the cardiac sphincter. Also called the LES or the lower esophageal sphincter. It got its name because if you were working in the emergency room tonight and 100 patients came in with chest pain, kind of epigastric substernal, you'd probably send about 85 or 90 of them home with Maalox or some antacid because the pain that's elicited by hydrochloric acid that's inside of the stomach coming up through that cardiac sphincter mimics the pain of the angina pectoris of a heart attack. So that's where it, hence it got its name, the cardiac sphincter. Now we're inside of my stomach. Remember the stomach is gonna, so here's my stomach. Remember the stomach is gonna have cells inside of it called parietal cells. And those parietal cells are going to secrete hydrochloric acid with a pH of about 2. So here's my hydrochloric acid. That's what I was saying when someone gets reflux. It's nothing more than hydrochloric acid passing up into the esophagus. But remember the stomach has also got mucus cells. And those mucus cells are what protect it from getting an ulcer. Because if I didn't have the mucus cells, that hydrochloric acid would literally burn a hole. And that's why when people get stomach ulcers, you see what are called coffee ground emesis. It almost looks like someone throwing up coffee. But of course, once it erodes the blood vessel, very, very difficult to control the bleeding. So now remember, there's going to be different portions of it. Look very carefully in the textbook. You'll see like this is called the greater curvature, just to give you some examples of their name. It's just called that because of the greater angle of the curve. This is going to be called my lesser curvature. Again, just a terminology. When you were maybe doing an upper GI, you're going to be looking at the, where that pathology may possibly be. As I work my way down, I go into what's called the pylorus of the stomach. Remember the pylorus of the stomach is where there's going to be a bacteria that's going to live called H or Helicobacter pylori. That's one of the most common causes of what I would call unknown reflux or unknown ulcers. And the reason why it's an unknown cause is because the person is not, it's not a sensitivity to food. It's nothing to do with some kind of pressure wave is that they're positive for H. pylori, which literally erodes the stomach and causes a true stomach ulcer. That can be very easily treated 
If it's left untreated, it leads to gastric cancer. But you can treat H. pylori first by diagnosing with either a blood test or a sodium urease test, which is a breath test. If it comes back positive, you can literally treat with an antibiotic. There's actually generally going to be two antibiotics and probably also use an H2 blocker such as a cimetidine or ranitidine or famotidine. Of course, you know, those are the basis of a bunch of lawsuits and litigation from allegedly having some rocket fuel, MDMA or something additive in them right now. And then also a PPI or a proton pump inhibitor, omeprazole, esmeprazole, used to be called Nexium. But again, those are also the subject of litigation because they're claiming that people on long-term PPIs are causing them to have renal failure from the way it's affecting their magnesium. So when I get to the pylorus, I'm going to have a second sphincter here, and that's going to be called the pyloric sphincter. Remember, the pyloric sphincter is going to basically control gastric emptying. So I always think of the stories always about the guy went to three Thanksgivings and went to his parents, he went to his in-laws and into his aunt. By the time he got to his aunt's house, he's had three Thanksgiving dinners and he feels like the turkey and the dressing is coming up to his eyeballs. That's because his stomach is so filled up that it can no longer be processed effectively by the intestine and therefore it starts backing up and making him feel nauseated. So pyloric sphincter, that's the significance of knowing that. You also want to relate that to SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, or crib death, because they've seen now that more than 50% of children that die of crib death, turns out that they have pyloric stenosis, or narrowing of the pyloric sphincter, and it causes the formula to back up into the throat, and therefore as a result of back up into the throat, the child literally chokes and stops breathing, has a respiratory arrest, cardiac arrest, and dies. So again, significance unknown, the pyloric sphincter. Once I leave the pyloric sphincter, I'm going to go into the small intestine, or SI. Remember, the small intestine is comprised of the duodenum. That's probably the most important portion. It's only about nine inches long, so it's a very short portion. That's where I'm going to have the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas are going to have their exocrine secretions into the duodenum. That's why it's so significant. Once I leave the duodenum, I'm going to have the second portion, so duodenum is proximal. Second portion is the jejunum. So that's going to be the middle or medial portion of the small intestine. And then I'm going to have the ileum, the I-L-E-U-M. Remember, that's going to be the distal portion of the small intestine. But remember that there's also something called the I-L-I-U-M or the ileum. But you remember from 168, that was actually the bone of the pelvic girdle. So remember, there's an ileum and there's an ileum. The ile with the I... That's the ileum, and that's going to be bone. I with the E, that's going to be the GR digestive tract. Once I leave the ileum, I'm going to go into a, a cecum. So I'm just going to bring this down, and I'm going to have a little pouch here, and that's going to be called the cecum. The cecum is really a storage pouch. So that's where it's going to store the stool until I get some type of a gastrocolic reflex and says it's time to literally empty the colon. What, so there's a little valve here, and I'm just going to kind of draw, it's kind of a floppy valve that sits right here, and that's called the ileocecal valve. I think it's kind of good to remember a story with that. Remember, that's going to then empty into the colon. Remember the colon is another name for the LI or the large intestine. And then the large intestine, so the LI or large intestine is to be comprised of the 
ascending colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectal colon, transverse colon. You'll see a diagram in the book that you'll probably be tested on that's going to ask about each of those portions. Once I leave the large intestine and finally it's time to empty it out, I'm going to end up going into passing through two sphincters. So just kind of think that now you're going to have the structure down here and this is the anus. So I'm going to have two sphincters and I'm just going to go to a fresh page here so you can see this very easily. So again, if this is my colon coming down, I'm sorry, my small intestine coming down, so I'm in my ileum. I've now gone into my cecum. I've got a valve here called the ileocecal valve, and now I'm going to be inside of the colon. Remember, the colon is going to go into, finally, and extend out to the outer portion part of the body and there's going to be the anus or the rectum. But before I get there I'm going to have two more sphincters and those two sphincters are going to be the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is going to be smooth muscle and that's going to say, got to go. And the external anal sphincter is going to be skeletal muscle. And that's going to say, not now. Or not here. So remember, those are going to be under involuntary control. And this is voluntary control. And I always think of the way you really think how this really works is that you went to bed last night. When you went to bed last night, and going back to, I guess, your picture to make it very simple for you, you went to bed last night and you probably had three slices of pizza and two Big Macs and probably decided that you felt a little constipated recently and probably took a bottle of citrate of magnesia. About 4 a.m., you notice a little rumbling in the GI tract, and that was the citrate of magnesia adding some water into your colon. You got up and made a pot of coffee, and as soon as you drank the first cup of coffee, you had to run to the bathroom and make a bowel movement. And the question is, how did that really happen? And what happened is when I took my first cup of coffee, and swallowed, it caused what's called the gastrocolic reflex. And so, to make it very simple, by swallowing the coffee, that caused my skeletal portion of my esophagus, or the proximal esophagus, where I've got my, basically my pharyngeal constrictors, the swallowing caused the reflex action to take this and open up this ileocecal valve. So as soon as I drank that cup of coffee, a wave of peristalsis worked its way from the stomach. The stomach, then that wave of peristalsis worked its way through this little small intestine, worked its way into the cecum, and the cecum then sent that wave of action to the colon, and therefore the gastrocolic reflex told me to open up my external anal sphincter and you had a bowel movement. And really that's how you want to think of how the body reacts. It's a series of reflexes that we can control up to a point. It's just like when we're talking about the respiratory system. My brain can override my brain stem to a point and when my CO2 levels go too high if I'm normal or my O2 levels go too low if I'm a COPD patient, it's my basically brainstem or vegetative brain that takes over. Well, same thing with this, you know, is that my urinary system's the same way, my GI system is the same way, 
because they both have these sphincters, external and internal sphincters. So I can override this sphincter of my, my sphincter, that pressure wave, only to a point. But once that pressure zone gets too high, I no longer can override that sphincter. So that's kind of a quick overview of the GI tract, digestive tract. So you're going to want to know, besides that, you want to review some of the organs of it. So make sure you know something about the pancreas. Pancreas we actually already covered in the endocrine system, so that should be fairly reviewed for you. Remember the pancreas is one of those organs that's going to be a dual organ. It's going to be an exocrine and an endocrine system organ. It's going to have the HCO3 bicarbonate and amylase coming out of the exocrine portion. And then you're going to have glucagon and insulin coming out of the endocrine portion. You also want to remember, know something about the liver and the portions of the liver. Always remember the liver not only is going to produce my the uh, liver proteins or the plasma proteins, but I always think of the liver has got a thousand and one uses. Then we're going to have my gallbladder. Remember the gallbladder is not going to produce bile. It's literally just going to concentrate bile. So that's why a person could literally live without a gallbladder. It's just that they're not going to have that concentrated bile that we all would have. So those are some major structures that you're going to want to know about and how they're working as far as with the DI or digestive tract. Thank you.